So the role of the concertmaster is quite varied. Um, there's obvious things that we do, like setting the bowings for the orchestra, attending auditions and helping to hire new people. One of the less obvious things that a concertmaster does is act as a conduit between the conductor and the orchestra, which is sort of a diplomatic role, and also often a translator as well. So for example, if a conductor says something really inspiring but not very clear, like, oh, can you please make this sound more like butter? The musicians might say, well, that's interesting, but what does that mean? So I'll, I'll turn around to them and give them technical directions. Use this finger, or play a little more um, airy with the bow or something like that. And conversely, when the conductor's not giving something that the orchestra needs, it's my job to go to the conductor diplomatically at the break and say, well, actually, um, your hands are a bit too low. Would you mind just standing up a bit taller so people can see you? I started when I was five, and I was very fortunate in Vancouver to attend the Vancouver Academy of Music, which I think took quite a um, unique approach to violin pedagogy. Um, I started with Suzuki and some orphan Kodai methods of learning, so a lot more using the ear. And then I had um, a couple great teachers, Laurie Hill and Gwen Thompson, who sort of emphasized um, using the mind when you're playing. So I played a lot of scales, but they would do something like, you have to play a G major scale, but while you do that, tell us your name, your address, and your phone number. So it would be like, my name is Andrew Beer. I live at 78 East 50, etc., etc., like that. So what, the, the way of doing it was, it's so embedded in you when you're playing these scales that you don't have to think about it. And I think I'm very fortunate to have had that at a young age. Yeah. Of course, when you're young, it's hours and hours of practicing when you, when you want to be out playing with friends. Um, and that continues somewhat as you get older. Although, the older you get, the more uh, closer to a professional job that you get, I think it becomes more about communication skills, working with others, and also the investment in your instrument and bow makes a humongous difference. So actually, about six years ago, when I was living in Montreal and working there, I had to make a decision, should I buy an instrument or a house um, and I'm really happy at the time I wasn't happy because it seemed like a lot of money but I decided to buy an instrument and now it's it's I don't think I would have got the APO concertmaster job without this violin so I think it was a great decision Yeah, th this is a violin I'm very fortunate to have. I picked it up um, six years ago in Boston. And this is a Jean-Baptiste Villome, who is one of the great French violin makers. This one is from 1845, so it's over 150 years old. And it has a, a lovely, um, sweet, but very rich sound. And um, a couple of years back, I picked up this bow as well. Um, this is a J.J. Martin bow, made 1880 in Paris. And Martin actually, um, as a young man, he worked in Viom's workshop. And something I like to imagine is that at some point in the 19th century, these two came together. And maybe this is like a reunion. I don't know if it's true, but it's a nice myth to believe in. Yeah.